Today we're going to talk specifically about spearfishing in the southern Queensland area, how to get started in this area, and Trevor's been diving here for a long, long time, as have I. Um, not nearly as long as he has, but um, we're going to lay out sort of um, some good actionable information if you want to get started spearfishing in the southern Queensland spearfishing area. After that, we're going to hook into a little bit of a conversation about boats, buying boats, some of the different options available, and uh, maybe a couple more questions about rubbish spearers as well. So. Let's hook in, Trev. Um, there's a really good Facebook page that you and I are admins on. Not anymore, I escaped. Ha, huh. you still are. <laughs> uh, yeah, I am. Yeah. Um, so it's called Southern Queensland Spearfishing. That'll be linked up in the vid. Um, so head along there if you are spearfishing in the Southern Queensland Spearfishing, uh, in the Southern Queensland area. There's um, 5,000 members, I think, on there, and there are some really good, helpful people on there. There's only a couple of dickheads. We seem to police it much better these days. It, 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 any like any forum, you're going to get some people that like to get their enjoyment from the detriment of others, mm. but they're becoming less and less prevalent. <laughs> this guy wrote a dickhead comment on the other day about some poor guy got his um, fin stolen, and um, I wrote something on there like um, a guy reported your comment as, uh, but I want to leave it here so people can see how much of a dickhead you are. <laughs> And then about four or five other people got on the bandwagon. And then I wondered why I wasn't getting any more notifications. I went back on and the guy deleted his comment. <laughs> he deleted his own comment, he learned. Yeah. You can be tricky, particularly in those situations because it's horrible for the person and he's learned not to do that again, which is what led to them getting stolen. But it's still horrible that they got stolen. So yeah, you don't yeah. kind of have to rub it in a person's face nah, when they've nah. made a mistake. That's not going to help them learn from the mistake. It's it's good to give them constructive criticism and help educate them instead of being like, nah, 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 nah. Yeah. No, that doesn't work. Is that your general sort of social media advice? Just um, To try and be more constructive criticism over dick swinging and saying how much better you are than somebody yeah, yeah, else? Cool. Definitely, definitely. Yeah, courtesy goes a long way, doesn't oh, it? 100%. All right, um, okay, so Southern Queensland, we've got, to the north of us, we've got the Sunshine Coast. You and me live in Brisbane, and we dive sort of the islands out here, and sometimes the bay when it allows us to. And then below us, we've got the Gold Coast and the northern New South Wales area. Um, so yeah, just, we're, we're very lucky. Within a seven hour drive in any direct north or south, we've got from Southern Barrier Reef, right down to northern New South Wales colder climate. So we're very lucky we get access to a myriad of species. It's good. How many species do you think we've got here? A the lot. Spearfishing. The record book probably has four or 500 different species and that's of the ones that are kind of worth chasing. Um, there's probably another 100 species of ones that people don't shoot anymore, um, usually from self-imposed regulations. Like it's not because we're not allowed to shoot it, but spear fishermen are kind of in like, ah, it's not worth shooting. Mm. Okay. All right, so guys starting in this sort of general area, um, what are sort of the four or five species that they might start off targeting? Yeah. Um, I think the most common ones, and this is going back to when I started as well, will be your ludric species, which everyone will rip on and tell you how horrible they are, and it's purely because they've eaten one that they haven't bled or gutted properly. So if you shoot a black drummer or a silver drummer, and you're starting out, gut it, bleed it very quickly, and the meat's not that bad. If you forget to do that, Mm. the meat can be very, very bitter and not taste particularly well. So you've got your drummers and your your black ludrics and your, your grass weed-eating fish. Mm. And you'll see them a lot in your creeks and headlands and in close. Um, then probably the next most prevalent starting out fish are your flatheads because they're a nice, when you get the hang of swimming up current, chasing them instead of coming down current, they'll be sitting there stationary and you can kind of come up from behind them and get, well, that kind of sounds a bit sexual, but you can kind of, come from their blind spot and wait no still sexual yeah. uh, you can shoot them a bit easier <laughs> <laughs> okay flathead and uh flathead good uh we've then got, you go on we've your, had lutterick and drummer yeah then you got your brims and your tarwine species which are all they look similar when you're starting out um the legal sizes are very are close to being the same so you don't have to stress too much about the differentiate the, the differences but you got your brims and your tarwines which are usually a coastal fish which you'll see in your areas where you're starting out in shallower water that can be bloody hard too, to, to shoot. Brim? Oh, when you're first starting out, they're, they're a tricky. Like everything, it, it kind of accelerates with you as you move along. So when you start out, what you think is a spectacular fish mm. will slowly increase as you get more into it. Because I can remember years and years ago when I shot my first legal parrotfish and I was 
stoked because up until that point they were incredibly fight, flighty, difficult fish to hunt. Mm. And we'll put that in as say the fourth fish is your parrotfish species. Because mm. when you're starting out, they're they're not easily attainable. Mm. But then as you've been going for a few more years, you mm. move on to other things. So it, it's kind of a a sliding scale, if you would. And then yeah, I'd say the fifth one when you're starting out, most people are looking for are the black spot tuskfish because they will move into shallower areas particularly during their spawning seasons. And you can get a nice fish still in 10 metres of water, a decent big black spot. And I remember my first black spot over five kilos and it was a, I was stoked. It was just one of those fish I'd been working up to for years. So that'd be the, your main five when you're starting out that I can think of would be your drummers, your ludricks, that species of family, then your flatheads, then your brims and your tarwines, then your parrotfish species, then your black spots. and always mixed in and through them would be your pelagics but they're not something you can really target they're something that will be there or won't be there you, they're a bit more difficult that way okay cool and did you mention maui uh, i didn't put them as a targeted fish um because they cop a lot of flack unfortunately but you're depending on the am. species of the moong some of them are beautiful like a slaty brim you lead that and fill that quickly beautiful flesh um your more blubberlips your tropical moorwongs they can be a bit more bitter but it all also with any fish it comes down to who's cooking it and not to sound racist at all but i found that you can give the worst fish to an italian chef and they will bring it out and you'll just be asking for more and i mean like get the worst fish you can imagine give it to them to cook and it, oh woo, magnifique mm, cool um while you're looking at these fish, there are there are a range of fish that you'll you'll be able to encounter. Another one's um, uh, surgeon fish. Oh, indeed, and same thing. Some species very yummy, some species not so yummy. Mm, mm. The grey sawtail ones are probably your better ones of the surgeon fish. I was just going to make a couple of recommendations. If you go into BCF, there's a Queensland fish guide in there, and um, you want to just maybe note down, mark the pages of the species that Trevor's identified. And what you really want to look for is not so much colour, because at depth you lose that anyway. And um, so pay, pay a lot of attention to the distinctive features on the fish and the actual silhouette. And if you can watch some videos, like maybe on the Submerged Psycho's um, YouTube channel, you'll see a lot of these fish, maybe not so much the ones we've talked about just now, because these are more entry level species, uh, but you'll see them being shot and what they look like in the water. Sometimes it looks a lot different than how they look on dry land. Oh, definitely. It's all silhouettes. The other one that you'll find where most of your identifying fishies for fishies, moi, fishies. species for fishies uh, is the mouth, eyes, and like the brow and shape of the mouth and mm. the nose is what will determine a lot of things. And just by focusing on those three points, you can usually pick a lot of different fish from each other. Yeah, it took me a while actually, like because um, I moved here from New Zealand, so I had to learn all the species. And for me, it was kind of a species by species approach. It was like you get the three. I think it was like um, the blubber lip um, uh, Mawong, and then I moved into the the, the gold spotted one, yep. which I thought was quite good. And then yeah, flathead, and then into the brim and stuff like that. And it was uh, a while till I shot black spot tuskfish and parrot and some of the fish like that, and then. You know, there's always a new species to approach, but oh, um, definitely. And uh, yeah, the the the, blah, the trick I was taught was learn all your protected species off by heart. Yeah. And then try it. Learn your protected species, the rough guidelines, because each species has their own legal limits. There's not too many individual ones. Mm. Shoot one, fillet it, eat it. You might love something that your best mate hates. Um, everyone has their own personal flavors and tastes, so yeah. it's worth a crack. We were talking about that before, like um, visitors from overseas come here and shoot species that we wouldn't normally consider, oh, like um, batfish, um, barracudas, another one. Yep. Um, it's not commonly eaten here, um, no. but people from overseas often love it. And when you're new and starting out, it's uh, a lot of the species that other sparrows don't shoot are highly sustainable because they're never targeted. Oh, and so, um, as long as you eat them, I don't really care. No, no I, as long as. It, it's always a thing of wastage, but if you're just shooting a fish to eat it, and as long as it's not protected and an issue, that's great. Like, it's food. It's, it's not being wasted. And small barracuda tastes very nice. Big barracuda, your lips will tingle and you can get a bit sick sometimes with cigaterra. But your smaller barracudas are very tasty. I, I quite enjoy small barracuda. It's just finding small ones is tricky. 
Okay, cool. I'll link um I'll link this book up in the show in the in the comments down below as well. But Queensland Fish Guide at BCF looks like the best one. There is another fish uh, another book I've heard of as well. I asked Turbo for it, but he didn't have it on him. So uh, That's right. um, another good one you got to buy directly from the publisher is Grant's Guide to Fishes. That's it. That's it. That's the one That's I was thinking about. Yeah, no, he he knows his stuff, and he's also got a Facebook page. So if you ever have a really tricky one, he's really good to deal with. Ninety nine percent of the time, you can send him a photo, and he'll actually tell you everything about the fish. Now he's a brilliant person. Good person. I'd like to do some more species by species stuff on the Gnome Sparrow podcast, oh, but definitely. we'll get there. Um, all right, let's go into the areas. So I saw a question posed the other day. Um, what's better, the Sunshine Coast or the Gold Coast for shore diving? It's a tricky one because mm. um, it all is dependent on time of year, conditions and those kind of things. Sunshine Coast is a lot more affected by visibility. It gets clean and dirty very quickly. You can have an hour gap of time and it can go from 20 meters vis to a meters vis, depending on tides and wind directions and swells. Uh, and completely different species that you're hunting. I mean, Sunshine Coast versus New South Wales uh, for, well not New South Wales, Northern New South Wales. It, it, there's no real shore diving. Well, there is, but there isn't off Brisbane. Yeah. Just because of the bay and it holds a lot of dirty water. You used to be able to shore dive Redcliffe up until about six or seven years ago, but I haven't seen this there in a long time. But someday, maybe, hopefully again. Guys were shore diving there last weekend, I think, or the weekend before. Good and on. They said they have five or six metres of this. Oh, definitely. You can get good fish there, but I haven't seen clean water in a while. Mm. But if, it, if there is clean water, it's worth a look. But again, check with your local fisheries department for the where you can and where you can't and the normal rigmarole. I, I remember the, the Gold Coast seems to, there's a lot more current down there generally, although the Sunshine Coast does also have spots that are really current affected. However, Gold Coast seems worse for it. Yes, well, you make a very good point. So the Sunshine Coast has a lot of bays that get you out of the current. So there's a lot of places where you can swim around, less impeded and have to worry about it. Whereas the Gold Coast is, if you look at the, the shape of the country, there's no real protection there. The, the EAC, when it's enclosed, comes straight down and then hits that and pushes outwards. So, mm. no, you can definitely cop a lot more current. I know I've had a few days when I used to physically be able to shore dive better off Kingscliff, getting back and like kissing the sand because you've been swimming against an outgoing current for like an hour just to get back in. Mm. So, now one thing that annoys spear fishermen is talking specifically about specific spots, and there's good reason for that because. If you start mentioning specific spots in a public place, everyone goes there. Oh, definitely. And it gets smashed, and you know, even relatively pub well-known areas can be um, just covered in spear fishermen too fast. Yes. Um, however, however, there's some broad areas maybe that we could mention. Um, I mean, Gold Coast. He, you already mentioned Kingscliff. Um, should we let's just talk about some of the legal areas down in, in, in the Gold Coast? Is that all right? As in where you can't, or where, yeah, where you, can? you can't. What are some general guidelines for not being able to spearfish? Uh, well, so Tweed River, all right, so general guidelines for Queensland is any public jetty south of Noosa, so anyone that's a public jetty, you're not allowed to spearfish or go within 100 meters off. So that's your sand pumping jetties, any jetty where a ferry can moor up to, anything that's for the use of the public. Hmm cannot spear. Private is a different kettle of fish and it's a bit of a grey area because technically it's trespassing on private property if you get within too much or you touch it but you can swim around it still. It, it, that's a grey area. It all depends on who has a better lawyer on the day whether you get in trouble. Mm. Uh, the other generalisations is any estuary unless it is determined you know, how do I put this properly? A lot of estuaries will be not allowed to spearfish and that's on a local area kind of setup but if you're allowed to in the river because you're yeah, sorry I'm trying to think of the right way to put it. if there's nothing saying you can't spearfish that river you're only allowed to spearfish until where it stops being brackish water so once you get to a point where it's fresh water you're not allowed to spearfish any further up that creek mm. so enclosed waterways in general are mostly for the most part not allowed however there are a couple of exceptions yes well it's meant to be the other way but on a federal level yes on sorry on a state level you're not allowed to do a lot of them on a federal level you're meant to be allowed to do all of them so you've always got to check with your local government as well as the general rules 
Okay. Um, and then, yeah, you've got your public appreciation areas, which are individual areas where you're just not allowed to spearfish because mm. of safety issues, which is fair, because you could imagine, hey, I'm scuba diving on this wreck, this is lovely, there's a spear gun pointed towards me. <laughs> it could cause dangerous things. And, you, like, let's say it's only two metres vis, your gun shoots five metres, you never know what's... Yeah, at the back yeah. of it. Yeah, it's a good point. So I can understand public appreciation. I don't agree with some of the places they've chosen 100%, mm. but I still have to obey and respect the rules. Mm. Just be aware too, like some of the spots uh, on the Gold Coast, like we're talking northern New South Wales, so you need to have a fishing licence for that state. Definitely. And uh, you can get a one or two or three day pass on their website yep. and just pay for a fishing pass. You don't want to get caught without one. Oh, no, no they're, they're, they're not, and which is fair, they get a bit angry about that. Mm. So Kings Cliff is northern New South Wales. Um, there's just some some ground in the Tweed River which you can um, spear, which Trevor's been cleaning up a lot lately. Um, there's some good spots to start down that end. Um, out the front of the Gold Coast Seaway, provided you're not, because uh, you're not allowed in the seaway at all. However, outside the walls you can, but the jet skis cut the corners as well when they come out at the front, and so you can get run down. Oh yeah, always have floats. If you're in a highly populated area, even if you're diving with a real gun, just have a mate hold the float, whoever's on the surface, and you mm. take turns, because mm. yeah, you gotta be careful. I've got a three meter kayak when I pick up rubbish, and people still nearly run me over. Yeah. Um, if you're curious about finding spots, like particularly down the Gold Coast, I would jump on Google Earth, and you will find uh, quite a lot of good information from just scanning up and down that coastline yourself. Oh, definitely. But um, yeah, look at the surface as well in certain breaks. Yeah. Yeah, they can run you over too by accident. And they can't turn very well. So if you're on certain headlands in certain areas, yeah, you just got to keep be mindful of the surface as well. Yeah. Okay, moving up. So Brisbane, for the, for the most part, is uh, not no, no short of spearfishing, for the most part. Yeah. 90% of the time, just because of visibility. Yeah. It would be north to the Sunshine Coast. If you go right up, uh, Point Arkwright off Coulomb can be quite good. Are there any of the headlands where you're allowed to has mm. rocks, but essentially there is rock from the bottom end of Bribey until you get to Noosa. north of Noosa. Mm. And it's just spread out and none of it's charted. Um, easiest way to go if you are wanting to go look for it is get up high on a cleaner day and look you'll be able to see it and then judge your shore dive off that so somewhere like Rainbow Beach go right up on the top of the sand dunes it, they're quite tall mm. look out and you'll see your rock mm. and that, that's how I used to kind of look for my shore diving options was just to get up high and have a look brings me to another good point though like um, a lot of these spots involve a good swim and just be aware that if you swim 400 meters out to a reef that's 400 meters you've got to swim back with fish and possibly against current uh, so planning around tides and water movement is essential yes usually run up. so i don't do too much shore diving anymore but what we used to do is we do the two hours up to high and run with the current and then the two hours away from high and that would then draw you one way or draw you the other way and you can kind of plan out which way you're going to move Mm. once you get the idea of it and i've stuffed it up many times and had to swim out against current and vice versa and it, it can be very tricky it's always good to have someone else with you i definitely don't recommend recommend shore diving by yourself i'd always take someone else i'm going to link up a couple of articles down below too there's new spiro's uh, guide to shore dive spearfishing there's two parts to that because um, there's a few things we haven't covered here like entry and exit points and things like that you need you need to plan and do your sort of homework before you hit any of these spots oh yeah so, but now that you've got a, maybe a general overview and uh, and some information with regards to species, I wanted to move on to uh, ideal conditions. Uh, so you're going on to some weather apps and you're looking at, you're going to pay attention to the swell, uh, wind, and what else, Trevor? Uh, tides is a big one. Um, so the larger the tide, the more chance you are to encounter a lot of current. So look for your smaller tides if you're wanting a nice easy swim. But in saying that, as you become more comfortable and more confident in the water, you can go out in a lot more difficult conditions. But when you're first starting out, try and look for the nicer conditions, particularly shore diving, because you don't have a boat there to bail you out. Mm. You're, you're, everything is dependent on your ability. Yeah. So if you can find a day in Queensland where you've had uh, 
not northerly winds or even easterly winds for a couple of days and it's under 10 to 15 knots wind it's going to be good from that front then you're looking for smaller tides and you want to dive on the high tide so get in maybe what, an hour and a half two hours before oh, it depends on the, the the area but yeah it, the high tide is going to be your best chance at cleaner water closer to shore okay cool because everything's running into the creeks, pushing the dirty water and holding the dirty water at bay. At low tide, everything's filtering out of the creeks, yep. and though most of those shore dive areas is where a near a mouth of a creek or near a river, and that dirty water is going to then inundate the area where you're swimming. Okay, so that's wind and, and tide, which are two of your big factors. The other one is swell, and uh, I personally would recommend, if it's under a metre, you're pretty much good to go. Between one metre and say 1.6 it depends on the direction of it and the gap between sets however it could be worth going uh, it depends um and the other one that can d cause you headaches with swell particularly in shallower ground is the surge starts to affect you mm. and the more swell there is the more sand gets churned up so you could have 20 meters visibility but you end up with heaps of sand in the water yep. you can only see one or two meters yeah and you're going to be diving shallow if you're starting so um the sand really buggers things up oh yeah and you can end up high and dry we've had it many years ago where people the wave moves out and all of a sudden someone's lying on a rock and then you get punished when the wave comes back in so it's always good to keep to keep a constant idea of what the swell's doing with regards to you because if you're in a meter of water with a meter and a half swell you can end up in a lot of pain yeah <laughs> good advice there's some amazing species to be had off, off Queensland. You, know, you can encounter Spanish mackerel from shore, um, jewfish. You know, there's quite a number of pelagic species. There's some really challenging reef species here. The, the fishing is good when it's on. Oh, yeah. Well, it's like any spot. On its day, it's, it's good. And you can go back there a hundred times and not have that same thing. But as we've mentioned before, write everything down. Yeah. Yeah, if you want to format for writing things down there's a spiro log which is sold at spearfishing.com.au pick yourself up a copy there it's good for logging down conditions but even if you don't do that just have a spreadsheet and keep track of the conditions yourself you can just do your own a lot trevor had a, a notebook for years that he wrote by hand and uh, they work just fine as well but if you want something that's all pre-filled out for you get hold of spiro log um okay what are the apps that you use in this area and you would recommend to new guys that are Target uh, considering going out this weekend. What, what 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 apps would you recommend they look at to help them judge whether the weather's worthwhile? Whatever you're comfortable with, really. Um, but don't use just one. So take four or five different ones and then make an idea off the information from those mm. and kind of work off the rule of averages. So if one is saying ten knots, one is saying fifteen knots, one is saying thirty knots, it's more likely to be. 15, 20. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Don't go with the one that says, oh, no, it's going to be 10. Yeah, it's definitely going to be 10. Yeah. Because it's all just educated guesses, which can be wrong. So always take everything with a grain of salt. Plan for the worst, expect the best, or hope for the best, probably the best way to put it. Expect yeah. the worst, hope for the best. There we go. Guys get pissed off uh, when you continually ask for viz and condition reports through Southern Queensland Spearfishing. You, you almost, uh, I mean, I can understand why people do it. You don't want to waste 90 minutes driving somewhere for no reason. Unfortunately, it's virtually impossible for me to give you a report. So let's say I went diving today at 11 o'clock on the high tide and I had 10 meters viz. Now, you're saying, hey, how was the viz? I say, oh, it's 10 meters here. Let's say it rains five millimeters tonight and there is a larger run out tide because of a full moon. Tomorrow, you could have zero meters viz in that exact same spot. So for you to ask for a viz report, I can give you an answer, but it's necessarily wrong. So people always asking, um, uh, you can't really answer it correctly. It makes it very difficult. And it also shows a bit, this could just be my own personal thing, but if someone is asking for a viz report before deciding to go spearfishing, they're not really into it. They're not really wanting to go. They're like, I'm looking for a reason not to go spearfishing tomorrow. Someone please tell me the water's dirty. Yeah, yeah. Right. It's best to just be like, okay, it's within a safe weather window. Let's go. It, yeah. Yeah, there's too many variables like thermoclines and everything else. I've done that before. Got up the Sunshine Coast and I thought it was going to be good. And I've driven 90 minutes and it's just a brown muck. Yeah. And, uh, and the swells is pounding in and I've gone out anyway. 
Oh yeah, and, and uh, it, it can be tricky, and you do have days that are horrible. But you can mm. also have it go the other way, and you're like, oh, it's going to be ridiculously bad. You get there, and for some unknown, strange reason, there's a clean pocket of water surrounded by filth. But there's just a clean pocket <laughs> of water that you can still dive in and have a good day. So. And that's also why you want to write that stuff down because oh, yeah. you can replicate that again next year. Everyone's going, oh, it's going to be crap, yeah. it's going to be crap. But, and uh, maybe... Not 100% of the time, no, but yeah, yeah, it does start to give you pattern. You can yeah, yeah, for sure. And like you sort of said, like when you go and you in these bad days or these borderline days, you start to develop an internal sort of matrix for judging whether or not you think it's actually going to be worthwhile. And... Um, there's these broad sort of ideas you can have about judging the conditions based on looking at it. But if if you really are keen and you love spearing, you're just going to go oh, all definitely. the time. Yeah. Um, what you can do and what some spear fishermen who will remain nameless do is who are much better at making friends than I am. They develop contacts in all the different areas mm. and they work. They have a lot more freedom than I do. And what they'll do is they'll just get the contacts to tell them when the conditions are right yeah. and then they'll just go. So they more reactively go than having to plan things out in advance, which is good. And if you're more flamboyant and better at making friends than I am, that's a great way to have just different people in different areas that will call you and say, hey, now the conditions are good, and that's when you go there. Yeah, yeah. Or not friends that um, give you bum stares all the yeah, time. Yeah, no, that's what I would crap. end up with. They'd be like, the conditions are really good right now, nine hours north, and then yeah. they go to where you normally dive yeah. and have a great day. All right, helpful websites, particularly around finding out if a spot is legal. Where do we go? Uh, Website-wise, it's tricky. Uh, best just to contact the local fisheries department to get them to tell you. Um, otherwise, you can look at Department of Primary Industries and all the ones that have the statute law that you can read through and find the individual stuff but yeah, it's just, tricky yeah contact fisheries like i've done it in a few places i got, many years ago contacted the ones at jump and pin and they actually sent me out maps that they drawn everything onto yeah and yeah they gave them very easily they just email them to you and you can see exactly where everything was so yeah always contact them first mm, i want to get hold of all of that stuff and link it up at noobspirit.com but I just haven't done it yet. It's a big job. It's tricky. There's yeah. so many little individual bits in so many different documents. Mm. It's not compiled yet. So I think we've sort of given the broad strokes on areas, finding spots, weather and conditions, species. Um, what are some of the other common questions that maybe we haven't addressed about spearfishing in this area, particularly for first timers? Boat diving or still shore diving? Because it's slightly different between the two. Let's just stick with shore diving for yep. now. Uh, chat. Um, one good one that used to be is joining clubs, and it still is, particularly if you're on the Gold Coast, join the Tweed Gold Coast Freedivers. It gives you a ton of information from people who have been doing it for 30 years. You don't have to learn everything for yourself. Um, there used to be one on the sunny coast, but unfortunately it isn't there anymore. Maybe someday in the future again, hopefully. But it, learning from others is a fantastic source of information. It's much, much, much more, more helpful. Um, it's like anything. If, you see someone else hit their hand with a hammer, you're less inclined to hit yourself with a hammer. <laughs> so I would recommend learning from others' mistakes and others' knowledge yeah. than having to do everything yourself because it just saves time. Yeah. One, one other thing you can do is, like, say you've got this area that you think is going to be good. Um, get a Google Earth screenshot of it and go into your local dive shop, which probably means adrenaline. And um, go up to some of the guys and just say, look, this is where I'm thinking about going. Do you know anything about it? No, yeah. No, yeah. Uh, learning from others' experience definitely comes in handy. A lot of guys will be a bit apprehensive to share their experience because mm. there is a lot of trust issues in spearfishing. Mm. Uh, but a lot of the time they'll at least give you some very general knowledge to help you out. You have trust issues and, and mum issues too, don't you? Not so much mum issues, but definitely trust issues. Um, <laughs> and a lot of your better divers have been burnt many, many yeah, times. No, that's true. From, that's true. They were like, oh yeah, no, nah, here, look, I'll help you out. I'll let you know the rundown. And then a few days later, there's a hundred people where they've helped that one person out. And, um, it can be very tricky. And once you do develop a reputation for being not a blabbermouth, but less trustworthy, it can be very hard to break that. Yeah. Very hard. Long memories in spearfishing. And like most sports and hobbies and things people remember the bad a lot better than the good yeah you've you we were talking about this earlier as well developing your own code of ethics uh especially with regards to species spots all these things you develop over time and um 
yeah, keeping things under your hat, especially especially people when people have taken you to their spots, is definitely crucial. So uh, one thing I learned and a way to judge it, and it could be different for every diver, is if it's something that is your own and you found it, you've dove it. If you want to tell someone a bit of information about that, that's not so much the end of the world. Mm. But if it's anything that anyone else has told you or anywhere that anyone else has taken you, you've got to consider it as like their thing. If you start spruiking about it or telling other people about it, not only will you most likely burn your bridge with that person and not mm. get taken again, but he will then tell others and it'll just end up intensifying to a point where you may find yourself not trusted by a lot of people that even though you were trying to impress someone, sometimes that person... Or even just be helpful. Yeah. Too helpful. It can bite. Like I had it many years ago with a very good diver around Brisbane. I would have... When, this is when I was like 17, 18. I was trying to impress that diver in order to gain his trust. But in me telling him information, I was showing him in a certain aspect that I was not trustworthy enough, if that makes sense. So yeah. in trying to impress that person, I actually was detrimental. Yeah. Yep, keep spots under your hat. Um, yep, that's a that's good good advice. Had a couple of questions here from New Spiro community. Matt Barrett says, "Can you give me precise GPS coordinates for some of your sunny coast spots?" Well, they wouldn't really be secrets um, <laughs> if I did, and a lot of them aren't really dove with precise coordinates. A lot of the sunny coast is very large, sprawling areas, and it all depends on the day where the fish will be. So it's best just to get in and kind of go with the flow, just go with the current and have you and a mate in the water and a guy in the boat and you can kind of keep moving and covering ground until you find where the fish are. Go back and listen to the last New Sphere podcast with Trevor too because we go into, into quite a bit of depth with regards to reconnaissance and conducting your own finding spots. Figuratively and literally. Yes. <laughs> um, Matt Gill says, when's the next episode of Just the Tips coming out? This is a submerged psycho regular segment, isn't it? Uh, kind of. I don't sure. Um, I kind of, it's usually filmed late at night when I'm not sleeping. Uh, I don't sleep all that much. So it just depends on when I have the time and the, I'm trying to think of the right word for it, not motivation, where something, something causes you to want to do something. Inspiration. That's the word. Mm. Okay, cool. Uh, some other random questions and moving away from pretty much spearfishing in southern Queensland. Um, sending equipment and second-hand gear, um, what service do you use? Do you just use Australia Post? Uh, Star Trek. So I organise a lot of it through Adreno and just give them the freight for it, which I don't know whether it's right or wrong, but Star Trek's quite good for sending larger equipment and it's not super expensive. Um, Australia Post is a lot easier to track and a lot easier uh, to access. Um, uh, the main one is if you're sending a gun, glue it in a PVC pipe. So get a bigger PVC pipe, put the gun inside, glue the caps on. That way, for someone to physically steal that gun, they have to cut the PVC tube open. Um, and they can't bend it or snap it or break it on you. Okay, cool. like it. Um, another quick one. Um, buying a Spiro boat. Prepare, <laughs> be prepared to spend a lot of money. Boat, uh, bring out another thousand. Yeah. Uh, in hindsight, and what I would have nowadays, I should have just bought a hundred thousand dollar brand new boat at the start and paid it off. So wow. I've spent far more than that repairing and keeping three other boats on the water over the last 10 15 years. Mm. So it can be a very difficult thing because it becomes more of an investment of love. What is the perfect size boat for spearfishing? That's a difficult question for me and what how I would answer that mm. is around 17 to 19 feet you can get 90% of places but you're not chewing exorbitant amounts of fuel some of these really big cats and really lovely 7, 8 metre twin and outboard great things but instead of being uh, let's say $50 each for three people to go out and do a 300 kilometre trip it's three or four hundred dollars each Mm-hmm. So your fuel costs definitely start to cut into your spearfishing time and availability. That dog is giving you shits. Yeah, it's fine. It adds character. <laughs> um, a friend of my of mine is thinking about importing a boat from America. Uh, any advice or insights around doing that? Uh, it just depends on the area he's wanting to go into. Um, some of the American boats are designed for like the massive bays on the inside of Florida, so they've got quite flat wide bottoms Beamy, yeah. yeah so in swell and in calmer conditions they can go very very fast and carry huge loads 
but when you bring them out here, which is a lot more choppy, mixed, messy swell, they mm. tend to bang and get thrown around okay. a lot. A lot of a lot of divers around Southeast Queensland are using very old fashioned boats with very sharp dead rise. Yeah. So they're not particularly stable at rest. They don't make the best line fishing boats, but but for diving, they run a lot better through the rougher conditions. And in particular, we're talking about like the Haynes. Uh, any of the old copies of the Bertrams, which came out in like the fifties and sixties. So your Haynes boats, sea not so much the seafarers. Uh, what are they called? VC. Oh, they're a bit uh, not so much, but yeah, there's a lot of different new companies that make flops off them, like Cuda Craft and Eden Craft and those kind of things. If you've got lots of money, but most of us are just fixing up the old seventies, eighties Haynes, seventeens, and nineteens. And outboards, you're a bit of an authority on that. Everyone I've owned has been horrible, and I break them. So you do put yeah. thousands of hours on them. Yes, um, but yeah, I, I uh, you want to have a reliable one. To a certain extent, or try for a reliable one. Have you ever owned a jet ski? No. no. What's your perception of um, buying a boat versus a jet ski? Depends on what you're using. The jet skis aren't as comfortable and don't have the same range. Uh, whereas with a boat, you can go 100 kilometres offshore. With a jet ski, you're kind of restricted to about 20, 30 kilometres. Okay. Round trip. Uh, you can also carry a lot more fish and a lot more equipment. Mm. Whereas with a jet ski, you're kind of stuck with only being able to have two people your basic equipment very small room for fish and you've always got to anchor and kind of swim around the jet ski whereas with a boat it's easier to drift and do all the rest of the stuff awesome all right man well um we've kind of covered this off we're Sorry. we've been pretty comprehensive if you have any more um questions about spearfishing in southern queensland join the southern queensland spearfishing facebook page and uh you can find trev at uh, Submerged Psychos or me over at Noob Spiro. But uh, yeah, any questions, chuck them in the comments too, guys. Um, we'll, uh, we'll try and sort them out. Do our best. Always happy to answer messages. Hopefully we've been helpful. Nah, I hope not. And, it, and if not, just give us a big <coughs> thumbs down because neither yeah, of us give a shit anyway. We can always do it again. We don't, it's not that we don't give a shit about helping people, but we just don't give a shit about negative comments. I, I don't know what I mean. <laughs> <laughs> All right. It depends on how the comment is written. Uh, thanks, guys. Gotcha. Gotcha.